Uh, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the 15th meeting of the 2000, in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I can remind you to put your mobile phones on silent. The first item on our agenda is to consider the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill at Stage 2. We are joined by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution, whom I welcome to the meeting, and Scottish Government officials, Mike Stewart, who is the Bill Manager, John Sinclair, who is the Senior Principal Legal Officer, and Fiona Lincoln, who is the Parliamentary Council Office. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his officials to the meeting. Uh, members should note uh, that because official, uh, that officials cannot speak on the record at stage two, and all questions should be directed to the Cabinet Secretary. Members should have with them a copy of the Marshall List of Amendments and the groupings, and will take each amendment on the Marshall List in turn. So let's begin. Um, the question is that section one be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, convener, I move Amendment 1 and will speak to it together with other amendments in this group. As I committed to doing so in my response to the Committee's Stage 1 report, these amendments provide for passenger exemptions under ADT, as well as making minor consequential changes as a result of these exemptions. All of these exemptions command strong stakeholder support and replicate those currently in place for UK passenger duty. And two of the UK APD passenger exemptions have not, however, been included in this group of amendments. Firstly, as I set out in my response to the Committee's Stage 1 report, the Scottish Government strongly supports having an ADT exemption for Highlands and Islands flights. However, after careful consideration, the Scottish Government has concluded that such an exemption has to be notified to and assessed by the European Commission under state aid rules before it is implemented in compliance with European Union law. The Scottish Government is working closely with the UK Government to resolve this issue and I will ensure that the Parliament and stakeholders are kept regularly updated on this matter and if notification to the European Commission is successful and subject to the Parliament's approval, the exemption will be introduced in secondary legislation under powers in Section 8 of the Bill. Secondly, the Scottish Government is not minded to introduce an ADT exemption for passengers on flights lasting under 60 minutes, which depart from and arrive back at the same airport. This exemption would appear to be the singular benefit of airlines which operate fear of flying courses, and as airlines already levy charges for these courses, it is not clear that the viability of such services would be impacted by an ADT charge. And they also have no impact on the Scottish Government's overall connectivity and sustainable economic uh, growth objectives. The Scottish Government considers it to be fair, therefore, that the aircraft operators running these types of courses should be liable to pay ADT on these flights. It is important to note that short uh, pleasure flights, such as those often run at air shows, will remain exempt under the existing chargeable aircraft conditions already set out in Section 3 of the Bill as introduced. I you, Cabinet Secretary. Any members want to contribute to this stage? Patrick. Much. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I understand the uh, idea of, broadly speaking, following the exemptions uh, from the current uh, tax regime. Uh, I suppose the question that I would want to ask is, in deciding what level of exemptions or what nature of exemptions ought to be applied, it surely demands that we first know what the purpose of the tax is. And this is a question that seems to have been open throughout the entire Stage 1 process. We understand that the purpose of the bill is to levy the tax, but I don't think the government is clear on what the purpose of taxing aviation at all is. The only uh, government policy uh, objectives that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in his opening remarks are around economic growth and connectivity, which would be best served if the government didn't propose this bill at all and wanted to exempt aviation from taxation altogether. Now, clearly, I would oppose that. But I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to tell us what he believes the purpose of taxing aviation is in order that we can then decide what the appropriate level of exemptions are. Yeah, Cabinet Secretary wishes to contribute to this stage. So, so Murdo. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I just really want to, first of all, to, to welcome uh, these amendments in the generality. It, it does reflect what the committee resolved in the Stage 1 report in terms of putting these on the face of the bill, and it's very helpful these have been brought forward. I just wanted to get clarity on one issue in relation to uh, Section 8 uh, and, the, uh, and Amendment 12 um, in terms of the um, ability of ministers by regulation to amend 
uh, or remove uh, the uh, exemptions. Uh, and it would be helpful if the Cabinet Secretary could just advise what the process would be should a decision be made to exercise that power to amend by, by regulation in the future. Adam. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'd like to um, echo what my colleague Murdo Fraser has said about um, uh, seeing these uh, exemptions uh, as amendments to primary legislation rather than to be made by secondary instrument. Thereafter, it is not appropriate um, for bills to be brought to this Parliament that fail on their face to define the scope of taxable activity or behaviour. Um, uh, I, I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary a question about the notification procedure to the European Commission and in particular uh, what the Cabinet Secretary understands the timetable for that might be. Is there any prospect um, that that notification process could be completed so that the relevant exemption can be um, made at stage three? Uh, so again, it's an exemption which is on the face of the bill rather than to be dealt with subsequently by um, a secondary instrument. And if not, what is the kind of timetable that we're looking at in terms of the notification procedure? Listen, I'm going to allow the Cabinet Secretary to ask three questions in a row each time. I'm going to allow him to deal with these so we can get them dealt with properly. And I've still got two other members who wish to ask questions. So, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, Convener. I suppose to Mr Harvey's question about the purpose of the tax, I mean, arguably it was introduced by previous UK governments uh, as a green tax. We could argue whether that achieved its purpose or not. Then it's contributed to the revenues a of the state and in the, the dialogue and discussion uh, with um, processes that have led to it being devolved to Scotland. It forms, of course, part of the budget, but the government has clear aspirations around uh, connectivity, supporting uh, the economy, uh, and therefore, you know, it's a power that the Scottish government will have, or the Scottish Parliament uh, will have, and it generates revenue, but it can be deployed in a way that supports our strategy around connectivity and, as I say, general uh, economic growth. On Mr Fraser's question around the order to amend exemptions, it would be affirmative order, so that, of course that would require the proactive engagement with Parliament and approval uh, of Parliament to amend uh, in future those exemptions, which takes me to Mr Tompkins' point that once we have a resolution to that issue around Highlands and Islands exemption, rather than necessarily go through a bill process, we'd want to have the power to do that through secondary legislation. So it makes the point about how we would want to use the powers in the bill to be able to affect change, but in a way in accordance say, with the parliamentary procedure. On the exact details of notification, because the UK government is the member of state, is the member state it will be for them to take this forward. And the engagement I've had with the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, um, it will be their process in which we'll engage with them. And I would also want us to engage uh, directly with Europe also. So I don't have a time scale for that. I think it would be incredibly ambitious for it to be concluded by stage three. Uh, but of course, our aspirations work as hard as possible for it to be concluded before the tax uh, is levied in Scotland in the next financial year, but that is in the hands of the UK government as a member state. But we'll certainly work as hard as we can to try and achieve that uh, within that timescale. But I think for completion at stage three feels very uh, unlikely in the engagement that I've had with the UK government. Right. Um, Neil. Um, as committee members will know, the, the belief that exemptions to air departure tax should be set out in the bill and that the earliest opportunity was a recurring theme in evidence to the committee from the Institute for Chartered Accountants to the Chartered Institute of Taxation. A significant body of expert opinion called for exemptions to be set out in the bill as opposed to through regulation at a later date uh, to reduce uncertainty. Uh, our colleagues in the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee were also clear that delegated powers should not be used as a substitute for proper policy development. I would therefore welcome the Scottish Government's decision to set out proposed exemptions on the face of the bill through these amendments. Willie. Secretary, just to ask uh, you to clarify that these uh, proposed exemptions are consistent with practice within other nations of the United Kingdom, and indeed are any of these types of exemptions reciprocated by other, other jurisdictions, perhaps in Europe or elsewhere? Right. Does any other member wish to contribute at this stage? Okay, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to wind up and deal with that question from Willie in the, in the, in the wind up? No further points to make around the substance of the uh, amendments and can confirm that um, the, these uh, exemptions, apart from the, the two that I've given, mirror the UK exemptions. 
Okay, Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm going to assume, Cabinet Secretary, and all your amendments you're going to be pressing, pressing them all, not yes. withdrawing any, so I'm not going to go through that process as we go through the, the, this morning. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We're agreed. The question is that Section 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. Now call Amendments 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Uh, I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 2 to 6. No, I don't. I have to get on block. I do. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 2 to 6? No. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, sorry, you need to move. I move. Apologies. Um, the question is then that Amendments 2 to 6 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Call Amendment 7 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with Amendments 8, 9 and 53. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 7 and speak to all amendments in the group. I move Amendment 7 and speak to it together with other amendments in this group. As I committed to doing so in my response to the Committee's Stage 1 report, these amendments provide for aircraft exemptions under ADT as well as making minor consequential changes as a result of these exemptions. All of the exemptions command strong stakeholder support and replicate those currently in place for UK air passenger duty. Any other members? No members want to speak, so there's no need for a wind-up. The question is then, Amendment 7 be agreed, are we all agreed? Yeah. We're agreed. The question is that Section 3 be agreed, are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 7, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. I move. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed, are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. I call Amendment 9 and name the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 7. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 9 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yeah. We agreed. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed or we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to or we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. The question is that Section 5 be agreed or we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. The question is that Section 6 and 7 be agreed or we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. Call Amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. The question is that Section 8 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. I call Amendment 13 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to, are we all agreed? The question, we are agreed. The question is that section 9 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. The question is that set schedule 1 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. Now I now call amendment 66 in the name of Patrick Harvey, group with amendments 70 and 71. Patrick Harvey to move amendment 66 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thanks very much, Convener. This group is the only substantial policy uh, proposal that I'm, I'm bringing, so I hope it's all right if I spend uh, a few minutes uh, setting out the, the rationale for it. I've written far too much, but I promise to try and skip through some of it uh, to, to save time. Uh, as, as I've observed at stage one, um, this is the first time I can recall uh, any government asking Parliament to pass legislation to create a tax that the government itself seems to think ought not to exist. Uh, and it's a peculiar situation. Uh, and it's unsurprising to me, therefore, that the government seems unclear about the purpose of that tax. Uh, but it's not only the government that's been unclear. Uh, I can't think of many stage one inquiries when so little evidence has been put forward by so many uh, for so long uh, on, on a policy change. Uh, on the environmental impact of aviation, I've also found it extraordinary that the government is so completely convinced that other actions in other parts of the economy uh, will be able to achieve the additional emission reductions necessary if aviation levels increase. 
and yet it can't say by how much it's willing to see those aviation emissions uh, go up. It's just not possible to have confidence in the claim uh, of additional emission cuts elsewhere if there's no clarity about the scale of the task being created uh, by the decision to give airlines a free pass. So uh, my amendments here uh, aim to put some, some purpose into the bill. They require ministers in exercising the power to, sit, to propose bans and rates uh, for the new tax to be clear about what they intend to achieve. I'd like to begin with Amendment 70. That requires the government, before the first exercise of the power, uh, to consult on and adopt an aviation emissions policy. Uh, in deciding how to prescriptive to be in, in framing that, I looked at the positions both of those representing the airlines uh, and the Scottish Government's chosen advisor on climate change, the UK Climate Change Committee, which previously offered advice uh, to both governments on the capping of aviation emissions at 2005 levels by 2050. As far back as 2009, that was an active discussion uh, between the committee and the UK government. The aviation industry, uh, meanwhile, in the same year, 2009, uh, adopted a set of targets to mitigate CO2 emissions from air transport. Uh, these included an average improvement in fuel efficiency of 1.5% per year from 2009 to 2020, a cap on the net aviation CO2 emissions from 2020 onwards, so-called carbon neutral growth, uh, and a reduction in net aviation emissions of 50% by 2050 relative to those 2005 levels. And Tim Aldersley of Airlines UK, in giving evidence to this committee at stage one, restated these commitments. He said, I can give you the assurance that that is still the commitment. And he said, as a global industry, those are the commitments that we have made. We've made them for a number of years, and we are on target to hit them. So the Scottish Government's advisor thinks aviation uh, emissions can be capped at 2005 levels by 2050. The industry thinks it can go much further and get a 50% cut against that baseline. Now, I'm sceptical about the industry's commitments, uh, but my amendment only requires that the Government commits to some target, some target for aviation emissions in 2050, expressed as a percentage below 100% of those 2005 levels. Anyone who takes seriously the industry's commitments uh, must clearly accept that that's easily achievable uh, in their terms. Now, that needs to be set in, in combination with an evidence-based use uh, of the powers in Section 16.3 of the Climate Change Act, uh, given the additional climate impact of emissions at altitude. <laughs> Amendment 70 then works with Amendment 66 to ensure that in setting rates and bans, the Minister acts in the way best calculated to help meeting the target set in the aviation emissions policy. Clearly, it's not the only measure that we would need to be taken if we were going to achieve such an aviation emissions policy, but it has to be one of them and it has to be used. Finally, convener, Amendment 71, the last in this group, uh, is in response to the paucity of evidence offered for the government's stated tax policy uh, of a 50% reduction in ADT take. Uh, the Minister agreed to come forward with various forms of evidence at a later stage, and I was slightly surprised not to see a, an amendment along those lines uh, from the Government. Uh, if we're to achieve agreement uh, as a committee on the nature of the evidence that we seek, uh, then it seems to me that we should define it in the Bill by placing a requirement on Ministers. So my proposal is for an assessment that covers the fiscal, economic, environmental and social impacts. Fiscal impacts, of course, include the revenue raised or foregone, uh, they also include indirect impacts, and I would be interested to see if the very surprising claims from the Scottish Tourism Alliance of decreased uh, welfare spend and increased income tax generated have any rational basis at all. An assessment of economic impacts would end the guesswork that seems to have been going on about the number of jobs that will be created uh, by the, the government's policy. Uh, on environmental impacts, I've included both greenhouse gas emissions and impacts on local air and noise pollution in the vicinity of Scottish airports. And in social terms, this, would, uh, this amendment would require an assessment of the share of the increase or decrease in ADT, which would be paid by each income decile group. And that information is easy to collate uh, from information that's available from the Office of National T Statistics. Uh, as an example, my party recently published these figures based on the assumption as, that would apply under a 50% reduction in ADT take. And we showed that the richest 10% of society would enjoy four times the financial gain of the lowest income 10%. Now, if our figures are wrong, 
wrong, the government's very welcome to correct it, to publish the accurate assessment, but in either case, that assessment would require to be conducted uh, before exercising its power uh, to set rates and bans. Uh, so, Kamira, it's, uh, it's clear that in order to continue to levy a tax on aviation, Parliament needs to pass a bill. It doesn't need to be a bill that sets that power into a policy vacuum. If the government's unwilling to be clear about the purpose, the positive purpose of taxing aviation, then Parliament should pass legislation which places these requirements on ministers. Uh, I don't have uh, much expectation that the Cabinet Secretary will agree with these arguments. Uh, if he wants to argue against the detail instead of the principle, then it's possible we might agree on adjustments before stage three. Uh, however, the intention of these amendments, from my perspective, is to make the bill itself supportable, to pass it without any such constraints on the actual impacts this tax power would have would be irresponsible. And I move Amendment 66. Thank you, Patrick. We now debate your um, amendment. Does anybody want to, to contribute to this stage? Neil. Um, as uh, committee members will know, many of those who contributed both to the Scottish Government's consultation and this committee's own evidence on the bill express substantial concerns about the impact an aviation tax uh, cut could have on both uh, the environment and the public finances uh, of Scotland. Indeed, a majority of those who participated in the Government's own consultation opposed this very course of action the Government are now proposing to take. We heard from campaigners like Transform Scotland that the aviation is already, industry is already one of the most lightly taxed industries in the country and that tax reductions would increase aviation emissions. The Government are nonetheless proposing to target this industry for a tax cut. We heard that the tax cut being proposed would reduce government government revenue by over £150 million per year at a time when public services are under pressure. We also heard that those who are, are frequent flyers and on higher incomes would disproportionately benefit, as Patrick Harvey has just outlined. There was also a considerable degree of doubt as to whether a tax cut would actually boost or benefit the economy in any meaningful way. No credible or convincing evidence has been presented to this committee to suggest that a growth in passenger numbers, for example, in Ireland, had anything to do with the ab abolition of their air passenger duties. Remember that here in Scotland, airports are reporting record growth in passenger numbers, and we saw figures just last week highlighting record passenger numbers at Scottish airports under the existing air passenger tax regime. Uh, domestic and international traffic both up in Aberdeen, well over a million people passing through Edinburgh Airport last month, Glasgow Airport reporting its 50th, 50th consecutive month of growth, and that's all with existing levels of air passenger duty. The case for the proposed tax cut isn't stacking up, and it would therefore seem perfectly prudent and reasonable to require the government to set out exactly what the impact of their plans would be before they proceed with any changes to rates or bans. We believe that the Scottish Government should be required to set out their policy intentions with regards to aviation and to conduct an impact assessment before setting the new tax levels. It is essential that the Scottish Ministers provide details of the evidence and information they are using to justify this uh, tax and tax cut. And this amendment, not Amendment 71 in particular from Patrick Harvey, I believe places a reasonable and clear duty on ministers to keep the Scottish Parliament informed about their plans. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Marie. Thank you, Convener. Um, I would propose rejecting this amendment because I believe that a statutory target for the aviation emissions would be inconsistent with the approach taken under Scotland's climate change legislation, in particular that emission reduction targets are set across the economy as a whole. Um, not for specific sectors. Uh, the calculation is that this would lead to an, a 3% increase in aviation um, emissions, which is only 0.1% of the total. Um, I think um, that's perfectly manageable and could be uh, managed within the whole economy rather than within that specific um, sector. I think in terms of the impact assessments, um, some of the assessments which are required under this amendment are ones which would be undertaken anyway. Um, I think uh, some of them would be very difficult to estimate. Some of them refer to uh, taxation powers, which aren't the remit of this parliament. Um, and I think uh, before this uh, is laid before parliament, we will see um, strategic environmental assessment, an updated greenhouse gas emissions assessment, a noise assessment, and an independent economic assessment. I think that's sufficient. Um, impact assessment for this. Okay, Marie Murdoch. 
Thank you. Commissioner, um, I think from, from Mr Harvey's point of view, the, these are perfectly reasonable amendments to lodge. I think my concern is that they are very prescriptive in, in, in their detail um, to be put upon the face of the bill. When we discussed these issues uh, at stage one and we took evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, I think it was quite clear at that stage uh, that when regulations were laid before Parliament to amend the tax uh, rates and bans, at that stage evidence would be presented by uh, the Scottish Government. Um, and at that point, Parliament will have the opportunity to assess that evidence and either support or reject uh, those proposals from uh, the Scottish Government. So uh, I'm not sure it's necessary to put this detail on the face of the bill because Parliament will get a subsequent opportunity to consider these matters. But it might be helpful before we come to the vote if the Cabinet Secretary could, could explain in a bit more detail exactly what evidence will be presented to Parliament at the point when Parliament will be asked to consider the setting of rates and bans. Commando James. Okay, thank you, Convener. Uh, I want to speak in support of the amendments that have been lodged uh, by Patrick Harvey. Um, I think it is um, absolutely crucial that the, the Government and the Cabinet Secretary uh, provide proper impact assessments and that these the, the policy is backed up by an evidence base. Uh, there's broad agreement about the need for the legislation in, in terms of allowing these rates to be set. However, it's quite clearly the government's policy intention in doing that to then reduce the level of ADT and therefore I think it's incumbent on the, the, the government to outlay their, their policy evidence for backing that up. There's two strands to it. Uh, as Patrick Harvey said, the, the level of you know carbon emissions um, been capped at 2005 levels by 2050. We heard evidence from, uh, you know, the, the airport operators, for example, that the introduction of this tax and the reduction of the tax would therefore result in an increased number of air travellers, uh, an increased economic activity. But the logic of that is at odds with the Scottish Government's policy on reducing carbon emissions. I don't accept the argument that's been put forward by Marie Todd that in some way you can exempt um, the, 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 the airline industry from that. I think it's got to be clearly got to be included as part of that policy. And the government must explain uh, how the, a policy which logically will mean more people travelling and therefore increased emissions squares with a, a policy of reducing carbon emissions. The second strand of it is the, the fiscal impact. <coughs> um, reducing ADT by 50% would have a, an adverse effect on the Scottish Government budget but of around £189 million. I think the Government needs to show how that £189, uh, it's 189, sorry, £189 million pounds, um, would be replaced. And I think it also has to address the arguments that Patrick Harvey put forward in terms of who would actually benefit. Uh, we've heard evidence that those in the top earning groups would, would benefit from uh, a reduction in this tax as opposed to those in the lower earning groups. So there's a, an argument about fairness and also an argument about the impact on the Scottish government. It's uh, the Scottish budget. Uh, so for, a, for those uh, reasons outlined, I support the amendments submitted by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, James. Ivan. Thanks, convener. Um, I think everybody's agreed that, and we debated this in the committee, that there should be an economic assessment and there should be an environmental assessment, um, myself included. I think the, the question here is what's the best way to bring effect to that? Um, and my understanding is the government's already launched I was about to launch the economic assessment, um, which I look forward to with interest, understanding how the numbers stack up. And that will be done in the context of what the proposal is for the, uh, the rates and bans are going to bring forward. And at that point, it will give us the opportunity to, uh, to understand that in detail. In regards to the environmental impact, again, obviously that's, that's important and we, we, we want to see the data on that. I understand the government's already undertaking a, a strategic uh, environmental assessment on that as well. But that needs to be understood in the context of the whole economy approach and the Times model, which um, looks at what the most effective way across the whole economy is to drive um, carbon reductions to meet the targets which the government has committed to, taking into account everything that's happening across 
all aspects of the economy and all, all sectors. Um, and we talk about aviation, but it's been highlighted, it's a very small percentage of the total um, greenhouse gas emission uh, in totality. So I think it's important that we're looking at the whole economy picture because to put something in here that constrains what happens, uh, this part of it doesn't stack up with the way we approach um, policy across the rest of the economy, which is the impacts 97% of the, the environmental impacts. I think for consistency, it doesn't make sense to include that here. I think the government's got um, a process on the economic and the environmental impacts, and we will see the data on that before we proceed to um, uh, debate and agree on the, 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 tax, uh, the rates and the bans later, uh, later this year. Willie. Um, I think, members, we did hear some evidence at stage one about the positive effect in Ireland of the, uh, the, the tax being removed there, not just for Dublin, but for the regional airports in Ireland too. And uh, the Chief Executive for Ryanair is in record as saying that removing this tax in Scotland could have a, a hugely beneficial effect for a, an airport like Presswick Airport down in, in Ayrshire near my constituency. So I think there's enough evidence led at the previous stage, convener, to suggest that there is a positive economic effect of this kind of measure. And I would just like to ask the Cabinet Secretary if he, he shares that view. Any other members to contribute before we go to the Cabinet Secretary? No. Nope. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, convener. The Scottish Government does not support the amendments in this group. In relation to Amendment 70 and Amendment 66, which depends on it, setting a statutory target for aviation emissions would be inconsistent with the approach taken under Scotland's climate change legislation. Under the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009, statutory emission reduction targets are set at the level of the whole economy rather than for specific sectors. The whole economy approach, which has been supported by the Committee on Climate Change, allows for the delivery of overall emission reductions in flexible and cost-effective ways. The draft climate change plan, recently scrutinised by Parliament, sets out how we propose to meet targets out to 2032 on this statutory basis. Setting a specific target for aviation emissions, as proposed by Amendment 70, would establish a precedent for less flexible sectoral emission reduction targets and challenge the basis of the whole economy approach established in Scotland's climate change legislation. The Scottish Government has noted the Committee's support for an aviation emissions strategy within the Climate Change Plan and will be responding to Parliament in due course on this matter. In relation to Amendment 71, the Scottish Government has already committed to undertaking and publishing a series of impact assessments on its ADT tax band and rate amount proposals before it lays secondary legislation before Parliament. Firstly, the Government has commissioned an independent economic assessment of our overall 50% ADT reduction plan. A contractor has now been appointed and the report will be published in the autumn. Secondly, a strategic environmental assessment is already underway and the next step of the SEA will see the government publicly consulting over the summer on our overall 50% reduction plan, as well as publishing an environmental report which will outline the findings of the assessment of the plan against a wide range of environmental topics such as climate factors, air quality, material assets and biodiversity. Thirdly, the Scottish Government is currently undertaking qualitative, sorry, quantitative assessment of the likely greenhouse gas emission and noise impacts of the overall 50% reduction plan. The noise assessment will be published in the autumn and the emissions assessment will be published next month as supporting information to the SEA consultation. The Scottish Government fully supports and recognises the importance of robust analysis of policies after implementation. Therefore, in addition to the analysis already being carried out, the Scottish Government has asked the contractor undertaking the independent economic assessment to consider the best way to design a robust monitoring and evaluation framework so that this can be put in place for assessing the social economic and environmental impacts of ADT into the future. The Scottish Government is therefore already carrying out a range of impact assessments which will be published before Parliament is asked to consider our secondary legislation which sets out the plans for tax bans and tax rate amounts. 
The Scottish Government also considers that requiring Scottish ministers to undertake a series of detailed and potentially time-consuming impact assessments before every time it wished to propose changes to tax bans and tax rate amounts would restrict the flexibility to respond at short notice to economic shocks. This is not something which Parliament considered necessary for the other devolved taxes, land and building transaction tax and Scottish landfill tax. It is also important to note that the arrangements already exist in relation to some of the assessments listed in Mr Harvey's amendment. For example, the Scottish Fiscal Commission will assume responsibility for producing independent forecasts of receipts from ADT to inform the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-2019 and the Budget Bill. These forecasts will reflect the Scottish Government's policy for ADT. If the Government proposes any further changes to ADT beyond its plans for a 50% reduction in the overall tax burden by the end of the current Parliament, and if these further changes were considered likely to have a significant environmental effect, it would be a requirement of the Environmental Assessment Scotland Act 2005 that an SEA be carried out before those plans could be legislated for or implemented. So the Scottish Government does not believe that it is necessary or desirable to make duplicate provision in the Bill by requiring that an environmental assessment be undertaken. In conclusion, convener, I therefore invite Patrick Harvey to not press Amendments 66, 70 and 71. But on reflecting on the uh, contribution of members, I think that uh, Mr Fraser is right that we wouldn't want to be overly prescriptive. But if I can work further and have further discussion with Mr Harvey on wording that could be uh, introduced at stage three to explore the burdens uh, on ministers and what we should consider and uh, reflect further on the bringing together of the various reports that I've outlined, then I think that's worthy of further exploration. But not being overly prescriptive and not putting unnecessary burdens on the face of the bill, I'm happy to consider uh, this uh, matter further. Thank the Cabinet Secretary. Patrick Harvey to wind up. And could you indicate, Patrick, whether you intend to press or withdraw as well, please? Thanks very much, Convener. Well, um, not for the first time. My favourite quote from the discussion comes from Mardo Fraser, uh, who says that from... Patrick Harvey's perspective, these are not unreasonable amendments. If ever I've been damned with faint praise, I think that was it. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the suggestion implicit, I think, is that we should uh, reject these amendments uh, purely on the basis that the government has offered to come forward with some uh, evidence base in future, and Parliament will then have the opportunity uh, to support or reject uh, the rates and bans that are being proposed. That's the point. Parliament will only have the ability to support or reject. Uh, what I'm asking uh, is that we place duties on ministers which they have to consider in developing their proposals. That is our... That's, in fact, uh, in how we pass this legislation is our only ability to affect the process ministers go through in developing the proposals which Parliament must then wholesale accept or reject without the possibility of a bit... <coughs> Excuse me, without the possibility of amending. Pardon me. So I would, I would uh, restate the case uh, for placing requirements on the face of the bill uh, in, in the respect to these, these factors. Um, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, mentioned earlier that the UK government originally introduced this uh, in part as an environmental tax. And if that was its purpose, I would certainly agree that it could be improved. It could be a, a much better environmental tax than it currently is. But that doesn't seem to be the government's purpose. The only purpose uh, that the Scottish government seems to have, uh, or certainly the only one that he's referred to, uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has referred to, uh, in, in discussing why he is proposing this legislation to create this new replacement tax, uh, is revenue raising. Uh, and yet the government doesn't seem to want to keep raising that revenue uh, in the long term. Now, I, I will be willing, if, if these amendments fall, to discuss uh, with the Scottish Government what else they intend to do, uh, but I'm afraid I'll, I'll, have the, I'll have to have that discussion with a, 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 wee, a, a wee dose of, of, of cynicism uh, when I have it. Um, I think there's been uh, also some uh, discussion of the evidence uh, that's come forward, and parliamentary committees tend to refer to everything that we've heard the oral and written submissions as evidence. Uh, in, in normal language, though, there is a big difference between evidence and claims. Uh, I think many of the claims that have been made for the government's policy uh, are without serious evidence. Um, now, I'm not claiming that there won't be 
any economic impact uh, from the government's policy, but rather that that needs to be set in the context of other impacts uh, and for us to understand the different kinds of economic impact which might be achieved. Um, the government says that it's going to be consulting uh, on uh, not only the, uh, the uh, evidence it intends to, to produce, but also on its overall uh, plan of a 50% reduction in ADT. I'd be curious to know whether the, the Cabinet Secretary is going to consult on what the overall ADT plan ought to be, or merely, here's our plan, this is what we're going to do, you can now tell us what you think. Consultation can be open or it can be closed. Um, but it doesn't undermine the, the argument that I, I made on several occasions during the Stage 1 inquiry, that evidence ought to come before a policy is adopted. And yet still, the Cabinet Secretary restates the fact that a 50% cut in ADT is his policy, before we have any of the evidence uh, that would rationally be required to, uh, to, to decide what the policy ought to be. Finally, uh, in the... the an argument that uh, the Cabinet Secretary and, and one or two other members have made, the argument that this is somehow inconsistent with the Climate Change Scotland Act and the, the idea that emission targets should be across the whole economy. That's exactly the problem with the Climate Change Scotland Act. And I say that as the, uh, the member who had the privilege of chairing the committee that led the scrutiny of that legislation. I think many of those sessions in this room we, all of us, all political parties, uh, agreed to set these ambitious targets and agreed nothing about how to actually get there. We all agreed on the destination, not on the actions, and we patted each other on the back uh, for our ambition. Uh, the idea that, uh, that, that we can uh, simply repeat the same process and not now, years after the fact, uh, begin to differentiate the level of emissions we think are acceptable from different parts of the economy and decide how we're going to reach uh, that objective, the actions that are necessary uh, to get there, uh, I think would be a, a mistake. Um, the idea that uh, aviation emissions can be managed within the whole economy, well, maybe they can, but only if we know what they're going to be and how high we expect aviation emissions to be allowed to rise. That is necessary information if we're going to be confident that other actions in the rest of the economy uh, are going to be adequate uh, to overcoming uh, that additional emission increase. And that's all that these amendments actually propose. Uh, they propose that we know what we're dealing with, we know what level of damage we're going to allow the aviation industry to inflict on the climate, and what level of actions are going to be necessary to take to, counter, to counteract uh, that damage. Uh, so I will uh, press, uh, which is the first one, Amendment 66 uh, uh, and the others uh, to the vote when the time comes. Uh, and I, uh, if, if they fall, then I will, I will consider what other uh, possible routes uh, are, are available to discuss these issues at Stage 3. Okay, the time has now come then. Um, the question is that Amendment 66 be agreed to, or all agreed? No. Okay, we'll have a vote in that case. Those in favour, please show. Those opposed, please indicate. Okay. Yeah. I guess there's no abstentions. There are no abstentions. Three, four, uh, there are three, four, eight against. There are zero abstentions. Uh, I now call them in. I now call them in. Amendment passed. Sorry? The amendment's not passed. No, sorry, the amendment's not passed. It's just obvious, but the numbers are just called out. Uh, I call Amendment 67 in the name of Patrick Harvey, group with Amendments 68 and 69. Patrick Har Harvey to move Amendment 67 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, this group uh, might be a little bit less controversial, and uh, to be honest, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm open to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary's got to say about it. I've lodged them only because uh, the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, uh, in its consideration of the bill, uh, came forward with a recommendation, and this committee, uh, in our Stage 1 report, uh, agreed with the recommendation. Uh, essentially, um, Section 10 uh, contains provisions which enable Scottish men to set, to set those tax rates and bans, uh, but the DPLRC committee uh, sought clarification from the government on the scope of the power, uh, and in correspondence with the government, uh, the, uh, the, the government stated that the provision was intended to to provide the government with sufficient legislative flexibility uh, to change provisions about rates 
uh, and uh, determination of a chargeable passenger's final destination uh, with regard to three criteria. Now, the DPLRC accepted that in principle, uh, but uh, considered that the section appeared to have been drafted more widely than necessary to give effect to the government's stated policy intention. And so their recommendation was that the government bring forward an appropriate amendment to more closely align the power in Section 10.2 with its stated policy intention. Uh, and this committee uh, agreed with that recommendation from DPLRC uh, and so I discussed with the legislation team what amendments might be necessary to give effect uh, to that committee's original recommendation. I would be interested to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say in response. Okay, and then I wish to contribute at this stage. There's Marie? No? Okay. Um, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, convener, the Scottish Government does not support amendments in this group. In relation to amendments 67 and 68, the Scottish Government consider that these amendments are either unnecessary or too wide, uh, depending on what is intended. If they are intended to clarify that subsection 2 of section 10 of the Bill does not duplicate the power already provided by subsection 1, we think that amendments are unnecessary. Subsection 2, when read in context with subsections 1 and 3, already makes it clear from the use of the word other that it only provides the power to do what cannot be done under subsection 1. In other words, subsection 2 already excludes the power to set tax, bans and tax rate amounts. However, the wording of the amendment 68 suggests that Mr Harvey wishes to narrow the scope of subsection 2 by ruling out any provision that relates to tax band and tax rate amounts, because the purpose of the power in subsection 2 of section 10 is to revise the structure of the tax when necessary, and because the structure of the tax currently comprises bands and rates, it is difficult to imagine what subsection 2 could in practice be used for if amendments 67 and 68 were accepted. The Scottish Government has a similar concern with Amendment 69, which could be read as restricting Scottish Minister's power to amend Section 9. If all three amendments were accepted, Subsection 2 would be so restricted as to provide no power at all. The amendments would rule out any provision being made that amended Section 9 or related to tax bans or tax rate amounts. So the Scottish Government needs to retain the flexibility to adjust the structure of the tax in whatever way it considers appropriate, and this could include, for example, redefining the tax rate categories that are currently set out in Section 9 on changing definitions of terms used in Section 9. So the current wording of Subsection 2 provides the necessary flexibility. The power does not need to be constrained in the way that Mr Harvey proposes. It is already constrained by the tight wording in Section 80L of the Scotland Act 1998, which only devolves power on a tax charged on the carriage of passengers by air from airports in Scotland. The nature of the tax may not be changed in any way. Any change that is proposed would require an affirmative vote of the Scottish Parliament. I therefore, I invite Patrick Harvey to not press Amendments 67, 68 and 69. I've got one, I think there's one person who just want to ask a question, Cabinet Secretary. I know it's not normal okay. at this stage, but Adam, I think he's got an issue he wants to ask. Thank, thank you, Gavina. If I may, can I, I'm not sure I fully understand, and I just, this is just, just so that I can understand. Um, section 10, subsection 2 talks about the structure of the tax. Section 10, subsection 1, talks about bans and rates. I'm not sure if I understand what is encapsulated within structure that isn't encapsulated within bans and rates. So what does section 10.2 allow you to do that you're not able to do under section 10.1? Okay. So I know that this one feels quite technical, but essentially there's clarity around what we are required to do as a government for making a substantial change, and that's mainly um, rates and bans. But in essence, any other amendments might be around terminology or understanding of that terminology in relation to the tax. So it gives us flexibility there, but not changing in any substantial way the nature of the tax or how it's levied through the rates and bans. Okay, Patrick Harvey, to wind up to indicate where you want to press or withdraw. Uh, well, Camilla, I still think the situation is a little unclear, uh, and I'm not entirely convinced by the Cabinet Secretary's uh, comments, but I think what I would like to do is seek leave to withdraw 67 uh, and consider how uh, this issue might be addressed, uh, if necessary, at Stage 3, in light of the Cabinet Secretary's remarks. Can we, does the committee agree with the withdrawal of 67? The committee agreed. 
So that doesn't need to. Right, I call amendment 68 in the name of Patrick Harvey. I read the debate to 67. Patrick Harvey to move or not move? Not moved. I call amendment 69 in the name of Patrick Harvey. I read the debate to 60, amendment 67. Patrick Harvey to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that section 10 be agreed to, are we all agreed? I call Amendment 70 in the name of Pat Patrick Harvey. I already debated with Amendment 66. Patrick Harvey to move or not move? Moved. OK, those in favour, please show. OK, those opposed, please indicate. Uh, there, are no, there are no abstentions. Uh, therefore... There are three, four, eight against. There are no abstentions, and therefore the amendment falls. <coughs> that one. Yeah, just seventy. So call amendment seventy. Call amendment seventy-one. Then you're right. Yeah. Yeah, call amendment 71, the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with amendment 66. Patrick Harvey to move or not move? Moved. Okay. Uh, can those in favour please show? Those opposed? Yep. Those who are abstaining? 3-4, 8 against them, and, and there are no abstentions. The amendment therefore falls. The question is amendment... 71 be agreed to, we're all agreed. No, no, no. Oh, sorry, no, apologies, no. apologies. Amendments for. Amendments for. Sections 11, 12, the question is that sections 11, 12, and 13 are we agreed? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I now call amendment 14 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, move amendment 14 and speak to all amendments in the group. Can we now move amendment 14 and we'll speak to it together with amendments in this group? These amendments deal with the requirements to apply to Revenue Scotland to register and deregister for ADT. The bill as introduced requires any aircraft operator who is either or will become a taxable person to apply to Revenue Scotland to register for ADT. The bill also requires a registered aircraft operator who is making quarterly tax returns to apply to Revenue Scotland to, re to deregister for ADT if they cease to become a taxable person. Further engagement by Revenue Scotland with stakeholders has demonstrated that it would not be practical to register occasional aircraft operators who by their nature only make infrequent or one-off flights from Scottish airports, in most cases with only a few people on board. This group of amendments provides that only aircraft operators who are or will become liable to make quarterly tax returns under Section 17 of the Bill must apply to Revenue Scotland to register for ADT, and the requirement to apply to register for ADT would not apply to aircraft operators making occasional returns under Section 18 of the Bill. Any other member want to contribute at this stage? Okay, there's no need for the Cabinet Secretary to wind up in that case. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to, or all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I now call amendments 15, 16, 17 and 18, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 15 to 18 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put in amendments 15 to 18? No members objected. And the, the question therefore is amendments 15 to 18 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 14 be agreed, or we all agreed. Yes. I now call amendments 19, 20, 21 and 22, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 19 to 22 en bloc. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put in amendments 19 to 22? No one objects. Uh, the question is, therefore, is that amendments 19 to 22 are agreed? Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. I call amendment 23 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, move a 23 and speak to all amendments in the group. 
Uh, convene our move uh, Amendment 23 and speak to it together with other amendments in this group, some of which have been brought forward as a result of the written evidence submitted to the committee during stage one. These are all minor technical amendments which either help provide more clarity and consistency with the provisions in the bill as introduced or are considered necessary for the efficient collection and management of ADT. Accordingly, I move Amendment 23. Any other member wish to contribute at this stage? No one's indicated. No need for the Cabinet Secretary to wind up in that case. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 15 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are agreed. The question is that Sections 16 and 17 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are agreed. I call Amendment 24 and name the Cabinet Secretary group with Amendments 25, 26 and 27. Cabinet Secretary to move 24 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, convener, I move Amendment 24 and will speak to it together with the other amendments in the group. These amendments deal with the eligibility criteria for aircraft operators to be able to, should they wish, to make occasional rather than quarterly tax returns to Revenue Scotland. Following further engagement by Revenue Scotland with stakeholders in order to ensure the efficient collection and management of ADT, it is considered necessary to amend Section 18 of the Bill by changing the eligibility criteria for making occasional returns in two areas. Firstly, pro by providing a more precise number of flights condition so that an aircraft operator intending to carry out taxable activities on more than 12 days in any 12-month period is not eligible to make occasional returns. And this amendment improves certainty as to the threshold level of taxable activity. Secondly, by increasing from £5,000 to £20,000 the maximum ADT liability in any 12-month period that an aircraft operator can incur in order to be entitled to make an occasional return. This is to ensure that the tax liability threshold is set at a realistic level in light of the threshold level of taxable activities. It is therefore considered necessary to amend Section 18 of the Bill by changing the date by which an occasional return is due from seven days to 30 days after the date of the taxable activity, and this will give aircraft operators and their representatives more time in which to make an occasional tax return and pay any ADT due to Revenue Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Anybody else want to contribute to this stage? Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Convener. Um, I wonder if I could just ask the Cabinet Secretary to say a bit more about that change of threshold uh, from uh, 5,000 to 20,000. Um, the, the explanation seemed uh, a little vague, uh, and I would like to ask specifically why 5,000 was proposed in the first instance. What is the, the rationale for setting it at that level uh, when the bill was drafted? What is the rationale for 20,000 specifically rather than any other figure? What are the types of operators uh, who will uh, be treated differently in, in respect of returns uh, as a result of that change in threshold. Uh, and in the various discussions the government has had with stakeholders, are there any specific organisations which have lobbied for this change of threshold, and who are they? Do any other members want to contribute at this stage? No other members want to contribute? Uh, just to confirm, we, so we do with that point as you wind up as well, please. Okay. Um, well, essentially, Revenue Scotland had been engaging on it. The, the five thousand pound figures, I understand, it was the same level of UK APD threshold, which has been sustained at that level. So, when we had an, opportun an opportunity to look further to what's appropriate, it was felt that twenty thousand as a threshold keeps within the, the seasonal flights. Um, rather than, say, the major operators and airlines. So that level felt, as part of the balance, is the appropriate threshold as opposed to what we inherited from UK, which is 5,000. I can get further information on that if required also. OK, um, the, the question is that Amendment 24 be agreed, are we all agreed? Yes. We agreed. I call amendments... Well, there's no suppose about it, it's either yeah or no. Comments 25, 26, 27 and 28, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 25 to 28 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put in amendments 25 to 28? No members objected. Uh, the question is that amendments 25 to 28 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 29 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Section, section Sorry, I missed it a bit at the bottom. Section the question is that Section 18 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. We are agreed. 
call, call Amendment 29 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Group with Amendments 30, 31, 36 and 38. Cabinet Secretary, move Amendment 29 and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, I move Amendment 29 and will speak to it together with other amendments in the group. Amendments 29 to 31 make better provision in the Bill for agents who may or may not be tax representatives to submit ADT returns to Revenue Scotland on behalf of, all, on behalf of taxable persons. Where this is the case, the agent must declare on the return that the taxable person has declared to the agent that the information provided in the return is, to the best of the taxable person's knowledge, correct and complete. This provides equivalency with the legislation for land and building transaction tax and Scottish land, uh, landfill tax. Amendments 36 and 38 are considered necessary to ensure that taxable persons continue to be responsible for the accuracy and completeness of information in a tax return, even where they have been appointed a tax representative. These amendments prevent a tax representative from making a declaration in a tax return that should be made by a taxable person. Any other member wish to contribute at this stage? No need for the Cabinet Secretary to wind up in that case. The question is that Amendment 29 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We agreed. I call Amendment 30 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 29. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment, 20, Amendment 30 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 31 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 29. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Call amendment 32 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with amendment 23. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 32 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments 33. I call Amendment 33 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Group with Amendments 34, 39, 41, 42 and 48. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 33 and to speak to all amendments in the group. I move Amendment 33 and we'll speak to it together with other amendments in this group. Amendments to Section 21 of the Bill make it clear that the voluntary appointment by an aircraft operator of a tax representative will not take effect for the purposes of ADT legislation until the details of the appointment are notified to Revenue Scotland. Amendments to Section 26 of the Bill will make clear that when the appointment of a tax representative takes effect. Different rules apply for depending on whether or not the appointment is voluntary or is required under Section 21 one of the bill. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Any other members want to contribute at this stage? No one no, no one's indicated, therefore, the Cabinet Secretary doesn't need to wind up. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 34 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 33, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 35 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 23. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that Section 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that Section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. I call Amendment 36 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 29. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that Section 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. I call Amendment 37 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 23. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 38 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 29. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call amendments 39, 40, 41 and 42, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 39 to 42 on block. 
Paved. Does any member object to a single question being put to Amendments 39 to 42? There is no objection. The question, therefore, is that Amendments 39 to 42 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that tw Section 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 43 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 23. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 44 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 23. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We agree. The question is that section 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call amendment 45 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to amendment 45. Convener, I move amendment 45, and I'm sure the committee will uh, appreciate this as my final uh, amendment to discuss. Uh, at the moment, the handling agent services defined in section 30 of the bill only include the allocation of seats to passengers and the supervision of passengers boarding which matches the UK APD approach. Business and private jet aircraft operators are increasingly self-service however with some only using handling agents for passenger baggage handling arrangements. The amendment is therefore considered necessary to ensure that Revenue Scotland is able to give notice under section 31 of the bill to a handling agent who only provides a passenger baggage handling service to the aircraft operator. I thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And those want to make a contribution at this stage? No one wants to make a contribution, therefore no need for the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to, have all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 30 be agreed to, have all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Sections 31 and 32 are agreed to, have all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments 46, 47, 48 and 49, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 46 to 49 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put to amendments 46 to 49? No member objects. The question is that amendments 46 to 49 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that section 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 34 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 50 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with amendment 23. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments 51, 52 and 53, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 51 to 53 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put in amendments 51 to 53? No member objects. The question is that amendments 51 to 53 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. The question is that section 37 are agreed. Is it be agreed? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that section 38 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call amendment 54 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. I already debated with amendment 14. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call amendment 55 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. I already debated with amendment <coughs> 23. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 55 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that Sections 39 and 40 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Now call Amendments 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64 and 65, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 56 to 65 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put 
on, amendment, on amendments 56 to 65. No member objects. The question is that amendments 56 to 55 are agreed. Sorry, 56 to 65 are all agreed. To, are all agreed. Yes. We are agreed. The question is that sexual, schedule 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that sections 41 and 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, that ends stage two consideration of the bill. Members will note that the bill will now be reprinted as amended. The Parliament has not yet determined when stage three will take place, but members may lodge amendments with legislation team. Members will be informed of the deadline for amendments once it has been determined. Uh, I'm going to just suspend this meeting of the committee for a few moments to allow a changeover, allow, or, sorry, to the Cabinet Secretary and his officials to leave, and I thank you for your attendance this morning. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is to consider a negative statutory instrument in relation to the Scottish landfill tax regulations uh, and ask members if there were uh, any comments they wish to report on this instrument. No, no indication given. In that case, the committee notes the instrument and agrees to make no recommendation to it. And I close this meeting of the Finance and Constitutions Committee. Thank you very much.